let's pick up where we left off. We were about to talk about the functions of circulation. The circulatory system, as I mentioned, has a lot of jobs. One is to, depending on what kind of organism you are, transport from gills or lungs, oxygen, also take carbon dioxide back, get rid of it, nutrients, hormones, energy sources, wastes that are produced by the liver and the kidneys. This is, I think, an interesting one, regulate the body temperature. So if for some reason, like, um, you fall into a really, really cold lake, your circulatory system will rush the majority of the blood to your trunk of your body, your major organs, and your head to keep it warm and to try and keep like your brain and your trunk of your body organs from dying. Uh, there was a quick question. Um, Thank you. Um, which of the following people would have the highest blood pressure during ventricular relaxation? So the answer is D, the ventricular relaxation is the diastolic number. So what you're looking for is you're looking for the highest diastolic number. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, let me know. Things not right. Sorry. Um, one of the things that will happen, uh, like for example, climbers, if you, if you have heard about people who've climbed various mountains like Mount Everest, that um, some of the things that will happen, like their nose will like, get frostbite because it's not really that important to keep warm in regard to keeping like their brain warm. Or they may lose like fingers or toes um, because your body's, your warmth is going to rush to the most important things in your body. Also, your immune system lives in your circulatory system and all of these things work together to supply your other systems to move things around the body as well. So let's talk about blood itself. Um, blood is composed of 55% plasma, more liquidy parts, and 45% blood cells. So let's talk a little bit about the plasma first. The, oh, it's right, you have about five to six <coughs> liters of blood you regenerate, you can regenerate one liter of blood in eight weeks. So if you do blood donation, which I encourage you all to consider doing it if you can, uh, there's always huge blood shortages, that you can go and get blood every eight weeks because you can regenerate that liter that they take. Plasma is about 90% water and the other 10% are all kinds of other things that dissolve into water. So you'll have proteins and hormones, nutrients, gases, salts, urea, which is a waste product of um, liquid waste. All right, so let's talk about that 45% of our cells. This I think is fascinating. Yeah. I was wondering, when you do like plasma donations, what are they trying to get, like the proteins in your plasma if it's 90% water? The proteins in your plasma, okay. yeah. Um, which can be very important for supporting people who have leukemia, for example. Good question. Um, red blood cells. So of the 45% of your blood that are cells, the red blood cells make up 99% of those cells. So I think this is fascinating. Oh, I didn't get to that figure. Oh, there we go. Um, red blood cells are also called erythrocytes. And they make up 99% of that 45%. That should tell you that, um, and there, well, did I tell you their job? Their job, I should tell you their job first. The job of the erythrocytes or the red blood cells is to carry oxygen, that's their main job. So that should tell you that this is pretty important if it makes up the majority of your blood cells. 
Oxygen is bound to the red blood cells by hemoglobin, which is a protein, and iron, and hemoglobin helps to also bind oxygen to the red blood cells. It's really important if you are uh, if you are anemic, it means you're deficient in iron, that you should take an iron supplement. Most women are. It's good to look for a supplement specifically for women, because it also will, it will often have the iron supplement. Um, if there is a, oh, no, a little bit about that. Red blood cells, other interesting things in terms of evolution, that red blood cells have evolved to have no nucleus. So here we have a eukaryotic cell that has no nucleus. It used to, but it's ditched its nucleus so that it could carry more oxygen. You know a little bit about a nucleus. A nucleus has DNA, and the DNA, part of what's in the DNA, I mean, it tells us how it's organized and constructed, but it also um, has all the programming for cell reproduction. And if you don't have a nucleus, you can't reproduce your cells. Exactly. So in our bone marrow, you make your red blood cells in your bone marrow. Yeah. So you said they developed to have a nucleus. So at some point, did they reproduce themselves? They probably did. Okay. And, and mutations occurred that favored them not having a nucleus or favored the bone marrow, whichever came first, chicken or egg, but um, favored the bone marrow to create them. Yeah, yeah. interesting, right? Um, your red blood cells live about four months. And look at this, two million die and are replaced every second. That's a lot. You have a lot of red blood cells because it's really important to carry oxygen. The oxygen helps us to efficiently break down our food, our nutrients, and energy sources through the process of cellular respiration, which is more efficient with oxygen. If you have a mutation to your red blood cells for sickle cell anemia, your red blood cells are misshapen to look like have little points on the ends instead of being round. Kind of kind, and it doesn't quite have a hole in the middle, but it's depressed in the middle. And um, these points can get stuck in places where you have twists and turns in your body, like joints. People with sickle cell anemia often have joint pain because they're getting poked by the red blood cells. And just think in general, like your organs are not perfectly round, so every twist and turn you can get these poking in. Um, they also don't carry oxygen as well, so person with sickle cell anemia also doesn't carry their oxygen as well, so it can lower your overall metabolism, which can have a great effect on your cell function. And there's a variety of other problems that exist with someone with sickle cell anemia. Um, kind of interesting, there are cures that are on the horizon for sickle cell anemia, so that's good news. So 1% of your blood cells make up white blood cells, and then we'll talk about uh, megakaryocytes or platelets. So the immune system, which uh, the immune system cells have a lot of different names. Uh, we can kind of lump them into, they're called leukocytes, but then they get all kinds of other names too, and we'll talk about some of those names as we get into the immune system. The white blood cells play a huge role in your immunity for tracking any foreign invaders that come into your cell, but also anytime you have an injury in your body, as well as anytime you produce cancer cells. Anytime a white blood cell gives up its life by consuming a cell that's damaged, or a foreign cell, or a cancer cell, it becomes pus. And it's just part of the process of the immune system sometimes. Last part in that 1% between the white blood cells, and then there's also platelets. Platelets aren't actually cells, but they're little broken off pieces of a larger cell called a megakaryocyte. It's a great picture because you can see the megakaryocyte, which is you know, breaking off little pieces of platelets. Platelets do really amazing things. They travel around your bloodstream and they look for uneven surfaces. And when they spot a surface that is uneven, 
they shoot out this network of spider webby kind of stuff called fibrin. These are some great pictures of what it actually looks like. And there's some platelets within here or here, and you can see the thickest part of the fibrin and that it's coming out. And what that does is it makes a trap in the blood vessel and it captures everything so that it can make a clot. And what's that, the biggest thing in terms of capturing, it's capturing red blood cells so it can supply oxygen to the area and support the white blood cells um, that are also going to start to clean up the area. When this happens, when you have an uneven surface in a blood vessel, like you, know, you sprain your ankle and blood vessels, amongst other things, are going to rip open, or if you have, and we'll get to talking about like heart attacks and things like that, where you have a blood clot form, um, what it's doing is it's trapping all of the things like red blood cells, white blood cells that are going to help to clean up that area and make it all new again. Good, they're good. Except for when they're not. <laughs> yes, and we're going to get to that. Yeah, I know. They're inten intended to be good, and then sometimes they can cause problems. Um, so, uh, one of the things about, well, how do we know how much red blood cells need to be produced, and what happens in times when you need an extra amount of oxygen for some reason, like you're sick? or um, you've got a clot. You might need extra red blood cells. So there's a hormone called, and this hormone's called erythropoietin. Erythropoietin, this is a P, P-O-I, ignore the E, erythropoietin. Um, Erythropoietin is a hormone that is produced uh, when your red blood cells are needed. So this erythropoietin is produced by the kidneys, but it's actually the brain that starts to monitor the amount of oxygen that's present in your blood. The brain monitors most things, and it's seeing like, do you need to start a feedback system We'll talk a lot more about feedback systems when we get into the last unit. But what is meant by a feedback system is that, let's say that um, uh, you're drowning, for example, and you need more oxygen um, delivered out to your cells. What can happen is your brain can go, uh-oh, the amount of oxygen, it's monitoring the blood, and the amount of oxygen in the blood starts to drop down. It's getting lower. And then it sends a hormone from the brain, and typically when we're talking about feedback systems, it'll start with the hypothalamus, and then it'll move to the pituitary gland. Hypothalamus produces something, which tells the pituitary gland to produce something, and it could have another couple of steps where pituitary tells something to do something else, and something tells something else to do something, and eventually it gets to the kidneys, and um, some hormone in a chain is telling the kidneys like, hey, what we want to do is we want to produce erythropoietin, which then is going to go to the bone marrow and tell the bone marrow pump out a lot more red blood cells. Because it takes a lot of energy to produce anything extra in the body, the brain is constantly monitoring, 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 and seeing like, okay, I see the oxygen levels are coming up because we have more red blood cells and there's more oxygen available to whatever's going on in the body. And once the levels come back up, the hypothalamus stops producing the thing that contacts the pituitary, that contacts this, contacts this, that contacts the kidneys, that contacts the red blood cells. We call it negative feedback because usually it takes one chain of these events to get to the last thing, which would be the bone marrow, and then it's like, okay, we're good, stop. So that it doesn't keep looping and looping and looping around. So again, you have some kind of oxygen deficiency, the brain notices this. Eventually, the kidneys are told to produce erythropoietin, which goes into the blood, and then the blood, whatever, uh, this erythropoietin tells the bone marrow, produce more red blood cells, 
to get the oxygen levels back up to speed. And once you have enough oxygen, it stops this from going around again, which makes us a negative feedback. So here's an interesting thing. If you've ever heard about blood doping, something that's popular, it often comes up in the Olympics, that one of the reasons why they are doing blood tests in the Olympics is to see what are the levels of erythropoietin in the blood. Erythropoietin, since it's naturally produced, if somebody like, if you know anything about Lance Armstrong, who um, won the Tour de France for many, many years as uh, it's a cycling event, that he just kept winning and winning and winning. And what they finally figured out that he was getting injections of erythropoietin and that was giving him an advantage to have more oxygen so that when he's breathing heavy, he has more oxygen available for his muscles and makes him actually perform better. And so now they've been trying to find different tests since this is something that is naturally produced it's like, how do you prove that that's natural versus like getting some kind of stimulation for it? Um, they're trying to get these finer tests to prove that. So yeah. is this like the steroid like the inject or is it? It's natural. It's just, it's a hormone. Yeah. So, I mean, some hormones are steroids. Um, I'm not exactly sure. I'm going to think maybe erythropoietin is a steroid, but it's, an, it's, hard to say that if you have all this, if you have like a highly elevated amount of erythropoietin, um, is it you or are you getting injections of it? Yeah, so it's kind of um, difficult to test for. Yeah, pretty interesting. All right, let's talk about the blood vessels. There's three different kinds of major blood vessels in the body. The arteries, and remember arteries always go away from the body, arteries do not always carry oxygenated blood. Most of the time they do, but not always. So remember, arteries go away from the body. Arteries go into smaller blood vessels called arterioles, and then arterioles go into smaller blood vessels or uh, break into smaller blood vessels called um, capillaries. Veins always travel to the heart, so they're coming from the body somewhere and going toward the heart. To the heart or to the body? Veins go to the heart. They go, they always travel toward the heart. Arteries go away from the heart. Veins go to the heart. Make it, you get it? Yeah. yeah. Um, arteries are very muscular, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, but you can see in this illustration that the arteries have a thick wall of muscle. Remember what I've been talking about, just like not just like muscle in your body, but there's muscle that's really important for helping our blood to pump around our body. And that veins, like we talked about the AV valves and the semilunar valves, the veins have valves as well, and the valves keep pushing blood toward the heart. They do have a muscle layer, but not as much. Uh, the way that they've evolved is they've evolved these valves and a thinner muscle layer. Thing. So here's capillaries. Capillaries are the point where the arteries and the veins meet, or the arterioles and venules meet. They're really, really small. They're about one cell thick. This is so cool to see a capillary with the red blood cells traveling within, that they're very thin walled. And the point of them being really thin walled is so that they can have really tiny molecules like gases, oxygen and carbon dioxide diffuse across them. Your capillaries come in contact with every cell in your body. red blood cells are bigger, so they have to go single file through your capillaries. So again, you've got arteries that are thick with muscle. They go into smaller branches called arterioles, and then in the middle, at the cellular level, you have capillaries. Veins have valves and a thinner muscle layer. 
they go into smaller branches called venules and eventually then meet again in the middle at the cells called capillaries. Oh. Vessels are called capillaries. So let's talk about some heart issues. <coughs> The first one I want to talk about is hypertension. Hypertension is a fancy way of saying high blood pressure. You're hyper, high, you're like energetic. So your blood is pumping really, really fast. Your systolic and diastolic numbers are elevated. They're much higher. Specifically, your arteries are constricted. So your arteries, which might have a volume like that, they're going to, that muscle is going to constrict. And what that does is it puts a strain on your heart because if your muscles are constricting and your arteries, what you're trying to do, what your body has to do is the same volume of blood, it's trying to push through a smaller space. So imagine that you have like some kind of a couch and the couch is wider than this doorway and you're like, you never moved and you're, you're just so tired and get to that last couch that you packed first and you're like, I am getting it through that door. I don't care that it doesn't fit. What happens to the couch? Does it get a little beat up because you're trying to shove it through a place that's really tight to fit through? Mm -hmm. So when you're, you have um, hypertension, and your arteries are constricted, you're trying to push that volume of blood through a smaller space and it's going to start to cause your arteries to deteriorate a bit. They're gonna get beat up. And your heart is working harder because it's like, I'm gonna push, right? Just like that couch, you're trying to push that couch so hard through the door, that's what your heart's doing. Is your heart is working to push that smaller, uh, that large, the same volume of blood through a smaller size. You can see if somebody has hypertension because their heart actually is larger. So if for some reason they get a heart scan, their heart may be a lot larger in size than normal because it's hard to muscle, so you're working it out too much. And it sounds like it might be a good thing, but it's not really. Um, what that can do is cause for angina that you have pain in your heart. So sometimes when people have hypertension and they get that pain in the heart, they think they're having a heart attack, but it's actually the angina from hypertension. One thing in the heart, one problem can lead to problems with other issues of the heart. And someone who has hypertension can then also accelerate atherosclerosis, which is a different heart issue, which is hardening of the arteries. Constant pushing of that blood, the same volume of blood into a smaller space can cause, like, just like the pouch, can cause damage. So you can have damage to the arteries and actually have arteries rupture as a result of this. It can cause blood to come up, you have internal bleeding. If that bleeding happens in the brain, it can be, a, it's called a stroke. If it happens in other places, it's just caused, uh, called something else. So if you have hypertension, and the doctor will say to you, okay, you have to lose some weight, eat less salt, and manage your stress. These are very difficult things to do in our life because salt's a preservative in almost everything. And uh, for you all, like someone told you, manage your stress better. I mean, who can manage their stress? We have a lot of stress on us. And weight loss is very difficult for most people that are overweight. So what they often will do is prescribe a medication that lowers the volume of water in the plasma. Does that sound like a good idea? To basically dehydrate your blood? It's lowering the volume of your blood by lowering the amount of water in your plasma so your blood gets a little like, thicker. That's not necessarily a great idea, so um, not the best solution. These are the solutions that really need to be to. So as I mentioned, if you have a uh, bursting of a blood vessel in the brain, that's called a stroke. Depending 
on where a blood vessel bursts will depend on the extent of the damage that can be done in the brain. So if it's somewhere toward like maybe the, you know, like as the blood vessels break down and it's like closer to an area that's kind of an end point and coming back, and it's not a kind of blood, a brain cell that's necessarily important for most of your function, then it, you know, people can have strokes in their brain and never know until tens of years later that there's some kind of a brain scan done and they're like, oh, you had a stroke here and here and here, and they might be like, no effect. Um, if it's somewhere in a really important part of your brain, um, it can result in a wide variety of things. The brain controls everything. So it just depends on where that stroke, uh, where that blood vessel bursts. What causes stroke? So we talked about hypertension. Uh, atherosclerosis, we'll get to. And embolism, so here's where you get to like, well, a blood vessel uh, uh, clot, not necessarily a good thing. Um, sometimes you could have like a clot in your ankle because you twisted your ankle and that clot breaks loose from cleaning up that area. Could be because hypertension, you've got the pounding of the blood, right? And so that clot is supposed to stay in that area of the ankle to clean it up. But because the blood is forcefully moving through the artery in that area, it loosens up that clot, and then that clot can move somewhere else. Um, that's called an embolism. If it happens, if the embolism moves to the brain, it can be very dangerous, right, stroke. Um, if you've ever heard of like a lung embolism, a pulmonary embolism, that could be very dangerous, depending on where it's at, because it could block the flow of blood back to your heart or to your heart. Um, and in general, just certain places, these embolisms can be really, really bad. Some people are born with smaller arteries. It's called microangiopathy. I mentioned hypertension. Um, some people have what's called AVM. It's another genetic disease. The, um, it's called atriovenous malformation, something that you're born with. I had a student once who had AVM and um, he had to really manage his stress to make sure that his blood pressure stayed calm uh, because he could die from increased amounts of stress. So he was taking two classes at a time because he was like, I have to manage my stress. I have to have a really stressless life. Could be a cerebral aneurysm, aneurysms. Aneurysms can be caused by atherosclerosis, the hardening of the arteries, or can be caused by hypertension or a combination of both. And what happens with an aneurysm is that the pushing of the blood through that smaller space or could be hardening of the arteries starts to bulk out an area and over time, it can stretch that area more and more and more. And what happens to a balloon if you just keep blowing it up? Eventually, yep, it pops, and so then that can pop. Where these are super dangerous are going to be your larger arteries, um, like in your, we'll call it the dorsal aorta. Remember the aortic, aortic arch goes like this, and then it goes all the way down your body where it starts to branch into your pelvis. That if you have a really big aortic aneurysm, this is a large artery that supplies the majority of the lower body with blood you could get a lot of blood moving out very quickly. You could also have a brain injury can cause uh, a stroke, a head injury, could be congenital artery defects, things that you're born with, could be prematurity. These things can be also related to something that happens in the mother when you're in the womb, could be virus related, bacteria related, uh, drug, alcohol related, so there's just so many things that can cause stroke. So I've been mentioning atherosclerosis, which is a fancy way of saying hardening of the arteries, that you get a buildup of, I call these bad and good, but quote unquote bad fats in the body. And it literally starts to harden the arteries so that they can't contract and relax, just like you feel in your neck. You can feel, you can feel your blood vessels, the elasticity of them in your 
neck. And so those over time can get hardened where they're not really pumping the blood, which you can't pump your blood, that's not a good thing. What they look like, what these hardened areas look like are this. And these deposits of the fat that can harden over time are called plaques. Just like teeth, if you get plaque on your teeth, you go to the dentist every six months and they do a cleaning and sometimes they scrape with uh, some tool and they scrape the plaque, the hardened stuff on your enamel that develops over time, same thing. You get hardened stuff but it gets deposited underneath the walls of your arteries. So plaques are made up of cholesterol. Oh, it just fell off. It's still recording. It just fell off. Thank you. <laughs> oh, I always have that. Never dull. Okay, thank, thank you so much. Um, so, uh, I don't know what I was saying, but. Oh, here. Okay, so plaques are made up of cholesterol. Your cholesterol, there's two kinds, main kinds of cholesterol, the LDL cholesterol and the HDL cholesterol. LDL cholesterol is low density lipoproteins. Um, these kinds of cholesterol are more so found in animal products than plant products. Um, they're called your quote unquote bad cholesterol. So here's the deal, is that if you eat animal products, and certain animal products are certainly better than other ones, like your red meats, uh, cow products, and pig products, um, they have a lot more LDL cholesterol than chicken, than poultry, than like chicken and, and um, turkeys, and also fish as well. Those are a little bit better for you because they have less LDL cholesterol. So, um, your body essentially, so we have like, let's say 2,000 calories is the amount of calories in a day that your body can burn off. You can consume them and they burn them and use them to do all the things in your body. And if you go over that 2,000 calories, you start to store those calories in your body somewhere. Now, they often say, well, 3,600 calories are stored as fat. And um, fat, we might think of like fat, but fat can also be like that kind of fat there. And it depends on the extra calories that you're consuming, what kind of fat they become. So when it's LDL cholesterol, your body, for whatever physiological reason, doesn't exactly know that it should put it on your butt or on your gut. And it takes it and it stores, stores it underneath the walls of your arteries. And so again, those are more like your animal proteins than your um, plant proteins. Um, coconut has some LDL cholesterol to it. So some fats that are plant fats do have a little bit of it. So just to like, mention that. Over time, these fats, when they get stored <coughs> underneath the wall of the artery, so it kind of sandwiches in between the muscle and the wall of the artery, and eventually um, what can happen is it starts out as a nice squishy fat and then it can harden over time. And when it hardens over time, it can actually cause cracks. And then um, you get this whole chain of effects that happen that as the fat is getting stored here, it's occluding or pushing into the volume area, which should be from here to here for blood flow. Now it's only from here to here. And if you get a if you get enough stored fat and it hardens, you can get um, an uneven surface. It'll break and you get an uneven surface and then your platelets see that and they respond by making a clot. And because your clot would normally stick like right here, if you had an uneven surface and blood could flow around that, now your clot is occluding the entire flow of blood and that's where these things get very dangerous so that your clot can get stuck there. And then your clot could also, if you have hypertension along with atherosclerosis, your, it could shove that clot into other places in your body as well. HDL cholesterol is your quote unquote good cholesterol, mostly comes from your plant fats. Your body knows what to do with it. When you have more plant fat than um, your 2,000 cat, like say, you know, your daily intake that can be burned, 
your body goes, oh, we have a little bit extra calories, we're gonna turn that into butt fat or gut fat. So it kind of knows what to do with it. Also, that fat can get metabolized easier. Your body knows like how to break it down more easily than animal fats. So let's go back to our little clotting area that we already have it's like bulking into the flow of blood area. Let's say that you get a fissure, you get a little crack in the surface because it gets dry, the fat gets dry and brittle over time. And then you make a, um, your platelets notice this area and they shoot out the fibrin and it attracts white blood cells to come to that area. So in that clot area, you've got a lot of activity that will happen is not just that you have this on your surface and on the platelets, they make this clot, and you've got all these white blood cells who are trying to also fix that area, so you've got a lot of activity going on. And so that can add to this already tight area that not only do you have this, but then you're gonna have a lot of white blood cell activity in addition. Your body also responds to any broken blood vessel areas by trying to put a cap on it. So that cap, and it also can occlude into that area even more. So while some of these things are good things, they also can be bad things when you don't have a lot of space and you're just adding more to the lack of space. And then the cap can dry out because the fat underneath is dry and then that can rupture and have these like things that happen over and over and over again. This is a picture of, an, of a blood vessel that is not doing so great. So the blood vessel should be, you have a muscle layer, and this is all blockage. All of this in here is blocking the flow of blood. responsible so if let me preface this that if this happens in your coronary arteries remember that your coronary arteries are the branches that service the heart itself they're not super big but they are super important because they keep the heart with a flow of nutrients energy oxygen takes away all the waste products takes away carbon dioxide if you occlude those the heart could just like not have enough nutrients, energy, and oxygen to function. So you can have a heart attack. So what can help you lower your ability to have atherosclerosis? If you have hypertension, you gotta get that under control. You might have other issues. Smoking super accelerates atherosclerosis. The toxins and smoke, smoke vaping, hookah, those can accelerate this process. Um, some people are just genetically predisposed to this issue. Um, we had a dean here. He was about he was about my height. He was 145 pounds. He was a marathoner. He ran many miles every day, and he was vegan, and he had a quadruple bypass. And we'll talk about what that means. That's a bad, really, really bad. That's four times as bad as a single. Um, he just had, he was like the picture of perfect health, but this, his genetics, not good. So um, obesity, diabetes, lack of exercise. Uh, exercise will help to actually boost your LDL, or excuse me, your HDL cholesterol, and also just having high cholesterol. Um, all of these things oftentimes are a spider web of issues. So um, what can you do? Lipitor, that class of drugs like uh, that Lipitor is in for lowering cholesterol, it, the, leading, the um, highest selling drug in the United States, Lipitor. Changes in diet, trying to eat more vegetarian food, leaner meat, exercise will, will elevate your HDLs and lower your LDLs and um, just you know, lifestyle in general, thinking about 
like even consumption of sugar if you are prone to diabetes or smoking. So those are things that can change. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about a heart attack itself. A heart, heart attack is called an AMI or an MI for acute myocardial infarction. It means that the heart cells are dying because they're not getting the flow of blood that they need. Specifically, as I mentioned, one, one or more of the coronary arteries are blocked. Rapid treatment can minimize the effects of a heart attack. So a uh, few things. One is oxygen. If somebody's having a heart attack, to so either if you you know have, I don't know, I don't have an oxygen tank near me, but if for some reason you're somewhere that has an oxygen tank, that's a great thing to do is put oxygen on them. Otherwise, it can be that maybe they passed out and you administer oxygen via CPR. Um, another thing is to give an aspirin. An aspirin will, um, uh, Aspirin will put more water into the blood uh, and it will allow maybe some blood to sneak by that clot. So that's a really, really great thing. If somebody starts having a pain, especially in their left arm, give them an aspirin. Aspirin for most people doesn't hurt. If they can't have aspirin, that's a different issue. Um, so those are two main things. Calling um, the ambulance also is another thing that can minimize the effects of a heart attack. So let's talk about some things that can um, medically happen. If you're somebody who they notice that, like this picture earlier with the plaques, and the, if you go to the doctor and they do a scan and they're seeing things like this, and let's say that of your coronary arteries, you haven't had a heart attack, maybe um, though you're just feeling sluggish or something, they can do a scan and they might be like, ooh, there's a blockage, like enough of a blockage here that they can do some procedures to get rid of those blockages. So they can be proactive. And um, this is what's called a stent. Uh, stent, uh, so here, if you've heard of the term stent, um, what they do is they go into that coronary artery and they have a little wire that has a spring at the end of it. Here's your spring, but the spring will be tightened and then the wire that's holding the spring, it has like a little claw on the end, goes to that area, and then the claw opens it up, and it goes like this, and it opens up that occluded area. If it might be, could be something that's like 90% occluded. They can go in and they can put it in a stent. And then um, other things that they can do, they can go in with another wire that has a drill on the end, and they can, they can drill away some of that hardened fat or they can do another thing, another technique where at the end of the wire, they have a balloon that's deflated, go into this area, inflate it, and it will kind of like break up some of that fat. Now, if, you're, if you have a heart attack and you need to have bypass surgery because you have a complete blockage here in this coronary artery, so all of this part of the branch of your coronary artery is blocked. What they will do is they will go into your leg and take a portion of healthy vein and they will bypass the blocked area. So they connect this portion of healthy vein after the occlusion and directly to the aorta. So you're getting a flow of blood now to the parts that were blocked before. This would be a single bypass surgery. If you need to have a double, then they do two veins, and maybe they do three veins, and then they do four veins. So for every extra vein area that they are sending blood flow from the aorta to just after the occluded area, that's an additional um, bypass. Amazing. All right, let's talk about, about another issue, which is heart failure. Heart failure is called dilated cardiomyopathy. The heart tissue dies. 
early signs of it, the heart gets weakened and stretched out. The heart as a muscle, if you have a muscle that gets weakened and stretched out, it's not going to do its job of contracting and relaxing, which means that the heart is not going to pump blood as efficiently. Many things can happen. Your metabolism can lower because you're not able to pump enough nutrients and energy around the body. You can't pump hormones, which can so slow down a bunch of other feedback systems within your body, but especially you will not send enough oxygen around. So it's kind of like a lot of chaos can happen from heart failure. The other thing about heart failure is that um, as a side effect of it, water accumulates in the lungs. So people can literally drown during heart failure. So not only can your blood not carry enough oxygen, but can't get enough oxygen from your lungs either. Right, who can suffer from heart failure? Both sexes, men and women, people of all ages. We see more middle-aged men suffering from it. They are predisposed for many variety of reasons. If um, someone's consuming a lot of alcohol, a lot of drugs, especially cocaine and meth, infections, um, that's why vaccines, childhood vaccines are really important because um, Measles. Measles can have an effect on attacking the heart valves. So, like the one, we're seeing a lot uh, bigger of a rise and issues of the heart valves because people are not getting that MMR vaccine to their kids early on. 400,000 people in the US suffer from this, and we have about 25,000 deaths, and this is per year. How might you know that you're suffering from this disease? One, you get short of breath because your lungs are filling up with water. Even if you sit down, because sometimes you might experience this where you're really sick, you have a flu or a cold or maybe you're in COVID and you might have noticed you were like shorter of breath when you were sick. It's kind of like that, but all the time. Even a little bit of exertion can cause you to breathe really heavily, also causes anemia because you're not carrying oxygen well enough. One of the good things is that it elevates erythropoietin, so the brain notices these issues are going on so that it can tell, go through that chain of effects to tell the kidneys to produce erythropoietin, which tells the bone marrow to produce more red blood cells. Also as a treatment, people can be given additional erythropoietin. So instead of that blood doping for, you know, like being an athlete, it's for making up the compensation of the heart issues. The cure is a heart transplant. About 2,200 heart transplants are produced, are uh, performed each year. A lot of people are waiting also. There's a pretty good survival rate of, um, after five years, 70 percent of people are healthy, and even at the 10-year mark, more than 50 percent of people are alive. Um, there's a big movement with people who um, have the heart transplant. They do marathons and to bring attention to this disease. Okay. So there's some heart issues. Let's talk about um, another system that goes right along with the circulatory system, which is the lymphatic system. The lymphatic system can cause issues like this, and we'll get into both of these. A big process that rules a lot of our processes within our body is diffusion. The process of diffusion, molecules move from high concentration to low concentration. Because your plasma is the majority of it's made up of water, the water will diffuse out of your blood vessels. And it's just kind of a natural phenomenon that happens. So if water is constantly moving from high concentration in the blood to low concentration in the spaces um, between cells, you can get dehydrated really easily. 
but our body has evolved a lymphatic system that where you have a circulatory system, you will have a lymphatic system that will pick up the leakage of water by diffusion. Eventually then the lymphatic system takes that water and it puts it back into the circulatory system. So pretty cool that we have these opposing systems that really end up working together. Also part of your lymphatic system are your lymph nodes, which have, have a important relationship with your immune system. In addition to lymph nodes, you have other tissues that are lymphocyte rich, like your tonsils, for example, and your thymus and your spleen are organs that are lymphocyte rich. So I'm going to go through each of these in just a little bit more detail. Oh, and just to give you an idea of like the circulatory system, you have all the branches, branches, branches all over. Same thing with the lymphatic system. Where you have, I always like to say, portals to the outside world, like your mouth, your nose, your ears, your eyes, um, your belly button, your urogenital system, where things can get into your body, you will have a lot more lymphocyte rich tissue or lymph nodes. It's one of the reasons why breast cancer is very dangerous because if breast cancer isn't caught early because you do have um, the ability to release milk from the nipples, that also can allow for things to come into that area. You do have a lot of lymphocytes, especially with also a lot of sweating that goes on in the underarms. You have a lot of lymph nodes here that cancers of the breast can get into the lymphatic system somewhat easily. You'll also see a lot more lymph nodes in the head and in the urogenital system area. All right, so first function of the lymphatic system is returning fluids. So all that leakage from diffusion of water in the plasma to the what we call extracellular areas or interstitial areas that has to get picked up. Otherwise you would just balloon up and like a balloon would pop. So like the circulatory vessels, you have your system of lymphatic vessels. These have to be very thin walled because water is super small. So water has to be able to diffuse through the walls of these vessels. Like veins, there's also valves inside. These are not, because they're thin-walled, they don't have muscle to push, or to, excuse me, they don't have muscle to squeeze like the arteries do, so they need valves to push the water through. So they rely on, your lymphatic vessels rely on these little valves, because the walls have to stay thin. Eventually you do get to larger vessels, lymphatic vessels that do have thick walls of muscles to push the water into the right areas to merge with the circulatory system. So like I said, these are opposing systems that where you have one, you're going to have the other one right next to it. You can see that in this illustration here. The green is representative of the lymphatic system, the red and the blue, the circulatory system, and the arrows are showing the diffusion of water out and then getting picked up by the lymphatic vessels. Right. What if something goes wrong? So there's a couple of diseases that I want to mention. Um, one is elephantiasis. Elephantiasis will cause scarring of the lymphatic vessel, vessels. So it can cause swelling. Oftentimes it's um, in an extremity. So like the legs, you can see this child is affected. Their scrotum is also affected. Um, could be an arm. It is caused by a roundworm called Ruteraria bancrofti.
they are carried, this kind of roundworm is carried by mosquitoes. So if you get bit by a mosquito, then a mosquito on its stinger can slip one of these roundworms into you. And the roundworms, they just instinctually know to go and hang out in the lymphatic system. And they can make a hole in there and scar up the lymphatic system and then cause an area to be blocked and that water gets stuck. Um, the main cure for this is chemotherapy, and it's usually about two years of chemotherapy. That's really tough. A lot of places, especially in the tropics, where they might not have as good a health care as we have, they might not have the money or the resources to have that therapy, and two years of chemotherapy is pretty hard on somebody. Um, the other thing that now there are also compression garments, we see them kind of everywhere, that you can wear a really tight sleeve or a tight stocking, and that can help also to prevent the swelling. All right, other functions of the lymphatic system. The second one is to transport fat. Here's something you might have not have even thought could happen. Because fats are so large, they oftentimes cannot get transported by the circulatory system. Um, you saw the red blood cells, for example, they have to kind of line up. They're a bigger blood vessel. Fats are bigger, so they might not be able to travel through the capillaries. So one way to transport fats around the body is in some of the larger lymphatic vessels. In our digestive system, because the circulatory system can't pick up those fats, the fats are diffused from the circulatory, I mean, excuse me, from the digestive system, the small intestine, into the interstitial or extracellular areas around the digestive system, and then the lymphatic <coughs> vessels pick up the fat and transport them. The lymphatic vessels are making their way back to the heart where we have water is added back into the circulatory system, which means that fats that are picked up outside of the small intestine are brought to your heart. So here's another reason why we have acceleration of some diseases of the circulatory system affect the heart directly. Specifically, the largest lymphatic vessels are going to merge with the vena cava. So fats go and travel around your heart pretty easily. So think about that. The next time you have a nice fatty meal, it's going right into your heart. Not right away. All right, let's talk about the next issue of the lymphatic system. Um, defense. The lymphatic system functions and works directly with the immune system. We'll talk a lot more about this especially again in the immune system. The immune system's big job, which the lymphatic system works with, is to protect our body against foreign invaders, also to protect ourselves against cancer kind of cells or any kind of tissue damage. As I mentioned before, some areas, like the portals to the outside world, they have lymphocyte rich areas so we'll have a lot of lymph nodes in these areas in addition when we're talking about these specific areas that have those portals the respiratory system right because a lot goes into your head digestive system and the urinary system largest amount of lymphocytes are in your tonsils because at the back of your throat, right, we're taking in water, food, air. So we have a lot of extra white blood cells in that area. Um, as I mentioned, with some kinds of strep that cause strep throat, for example, some people like me are just more prone to strep bacteria, certain strains infecting the tonsils. So I had to get my tonsils out. 
which also leads me then in the long run, I get the flu a lot or I can get colds a lot more. I don't have them there anymore. Lymphocytes are produced in the thymus as well as the spleen. So they are also, these organs are also a part of the lymphatic system and the immune system. And as I mentioned, any of those portals to the outside world, you're going to have lymph nodes that are going to be filled and ready to protect those portals, those areas that are in contact with food, drink, air, or anything else. So here's swollen tonsils. This is also mumps, which is another thing, the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine can cause the swelling of your lymph nodes in the face. All right, and then the last function I wanna talk about is filtration of old red blood cells. Um, that's the spleen. The spleen also filters out dead red blood cells. Um, you can function without your spleen, like you can into an accident. There's other organs that will help take over for that. Um, but it does 